invite you to open up with me to the book of Exodus this morning. I'm going to open up to Exodus as we continue on through this series that we've been doing. If you're here new with us this morning or haven't been with us for a a few weeks, we're looking at this theme of gifts during this time of Advent, during the month of December, basically. And we're looking at the theme of gifts in the scriptures. And last week and this week and next week, we are looking specifically at those gifts that were given to Jesus by the Magi or the wise men, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And we're talking about how each one of those gifts has a very significant symbolism to it and teaches us something unique and very crucial about the identity of Jesus. If you were with us last week, you'll remember that we looked at the gift of gold and we saw that gold is the metal of kings and that gold itself was a significant gift, not just because it was valuable, but because it pointed to the fact that Jesus was and is a king. Today we're going to look at this gift of frankincense, and I'm going to be reading a passage in Exodus chapter 30, where we're going back now and we're, we're looking at, uh, this may seem like kind of an unlikely place to open up for Advent, but what we're looking at here is this section of Exodus that focuses on the furnishings for the temple. And in chapter 30, we have a description here of the altar of incense that was in the temple. And I'll be reading Exodus 30, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll pick up later on in the chapter, verses 34 through 38. Hear now the word of the Lord. You shall make an altar on which to burn incense, and you shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and around its sides and its horns, and you shall make a molding of gold around it, and you shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it, a regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once a year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Now, picking up in verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stacti, anica, and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each there shall be an equal part. And make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we we desire, Lord, to give our hearts to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would open up your word for us as we come before you. Lord, we are prone to much misunderstanding and many weaknesses and many errors in our thinking. But we pray that you would open up your word for us this morning and help us to see more clearly the identity of our Savior so that we might worship you more fully, follow you more faithfully. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when it comes to the gifts that were given to the wise men... I would think it's pretty safe to say that gold is the most familiar to us. We know what gold is. We talked about this last week. Gold is familiar to us. It's a metal that is still very common. Um, It's still very valuable. But we know what it is. We still value it in our culture. So we can relate to gold. But when we get to frankincense and we get to myrrh, 
there things get a little bit cloudy because I would venture to say that probably most of us sitting in this room aren't really quite sure what these substances even are and why they were given as gifts to Jesus. Although I will say that frankincense and myrrh are making a comeback in our culture today. Did you know this? If you Google frankincense and myrrh, you will quickly discover that there are thousands of different products now that contain frankincense and myrrh and are being marketed. Uh, everything from beauty products to essential oils to aromatherapy and all these different things that have frankincense and myrrh in them and have all these different claims. A couple of years ago, I don't remember which one of our kids it was, but we were given a baby gift and it, had a, um, it was a special lotion. It was this baby lotion and it caught my eye because this baby lotion on the front of it said... Uh, special lotion with frankincense and myrrh. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't really know what that means. So I read the back of the bottle. This is what the back of the bottle says. I'm quoting directly from the back of the bottle. It said, quote, calm and comfort baby's delicate skin with this nutrient-rich moisturizing lotion. Our special blend of certified organic shea butter and chamomile helps soothe skin. Argon oil, frankincense, and myrrh extracts keep skin soft and smooth. Apply lotion on baby's skin after bath or any time baby needs a kiss of moisture. Excellent for calming and relaxing massage. Gentle enough for everyday use. Isn't that just wonderful? Um, you know, all of these calming properties, and uh, I'm going to sue that company because it didn't calm anything. No. <laughs> They put this on your, on your baby and you think, oh, it's going to calm. Well, no, it, that didn't quite work. Um, I don't know if there's any validity to all these claims about frankincense and myrrh and these products that people are selling today. But I can tell you what it was used for in Jesus' day. Frankincense is actually a resin that was extracted from trees, different types of trees in the desert mountains in the ancient Near East. And in the ancient Near East, it was incredibly valuable. It was traded by spice traders all over the ancient Near East. Uh, and when it was burned, it would give off this strong fragrance. It was often mixed with other perfumes and other spices as it was burned. Um, and it would give a pleasing aroma. Um, so last week, we looked at this first gift. And we looked at gold, and we saw that, yes, gold is incredibly valuable. But it, as I already said, it was special because it pointed to the fact that Jesus is king. Frankincense is similar. We could say frankincense was special as a gift because it was valuable, and that would be true. It was also very valuable, like gold. But it wasn't just that it was valuable. It was that this gift also pointed to something unique about the identity of Jesus. And today, this morning, I want to actually talk about two different things, two different uh, important things that are symbolized by this gift of frankincense. And they are, number one, the priestly office of Christ, and number two, the presence of the living God. So let's look at each one of these for a few minutes. First of all, frankincense pointed to and symbolized the priestly office of Christ. In the Old Testament worship, incense of any kind, and frankincense is just one type of incense, Incense was exclusively associated with the priesthood because priests were the ones that went into the temple and offered incense. And one of the furnishings that was in the temple was this altar of incense. It was an altar that was exclusively used for the burning of incense. And I want you to listen to these words again from Exodus 30, verse 7, which say, And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it, that is the altar of incense, Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. The incense offering was one of the ways that the priests went in and offered worship to God. It was as if this incense that was burning and rising up to heaven was a fragrant offering, a way of honoring the Lord. And it's worth noting that this was something that the priests and only the priests would ever do. In fact, there were very, very severe penalties for someone who would dare to go in and burn incense who wasn't a priest. We have a story about that in the Old Testament. It's the story of King Uzziah. If you read about King Uzziah, he started out strong. He was a, he was a righteous king in the beginning. It says that he set his heart to seek the Lord, and the Lord made him prosper. But we know this to be true in any, uh, in any station of life, that people can start off strong, but that doesn't mean that they finish strong. 
And Uzziah was a king who started off strong, but he didn't finish strong. And he became proud and he became uh, very foolish in his later years. Here's what happened. I'm going to read you a short passage from 2 Chronicles 26. It says, When he, that is Uzziah, was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. And if you continue to read that story, what happens is that as punishment for his foolishness and his sin, God strikes Uzziah with leprosy, and he's a leper until the day he died. What this shows us, it's a very stark illustration of the fact that incense was strictly associated with the priesthood. The only people who were going to be dealing with incense were priests and priests alone. When we get to Jesus then, and the wise men bring him frankincense, I don't think it's any coincidence that this is one of the gifts because it points to the fact that Jesus himself is a priest. Now, that may not be a typical way you think about Jesus, but in the New Testament, we are told that he is a priest. In fact, we're told he's a great high priest. Hebrews 4.14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Jesus is known as the great high priest. But what does it mean when we say that he's a priest or a great high priest? Probably for many of us, we're not even sure exactly what that translates into and why is it important that he has this title and this identity of priest. Well, let me mention three things that the priesthood pertains to in reference to Jesus' identity. First of all, as a priest, Jesus is our representative. He's our representative. If you go back to the Old Testament... There was a problem that the people of God had in the Old Testament, and that is that their sin separated them from God. Because the people were sinful and because God was holy, God cannot dwell among a sinful people, and therefore, that's why God had to be separated off from them inside the temple. And so, because they were sinful, first of all, God had to be separated off. Secondly, because they were sinful, they had to offer these sacrifices over and over again as a way of atoning for their sin. And only certain people could offer those sacrifices. And once again, the priests were the one who's, ones who offered those sacrifices. When the priests offered the sacrifices, they were acting as representatives on behalf of the people. In other words, when a priest went in to offer a sacrifice, he wasn't just offering a sacrifice for himself. He was a representative offering a sacrifice on behalf of the whole congregation, the whole people of Israel. And so these priests were representatives. Hebrews 5.1 puts it this way. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men. There's the representative to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So priests acted on behalf of others as representatives. Well, when you think about that, you realize that Jesus was also our representative because when he went to the cross, he was offering up a sacrifice on behalf of others. That sacrifice was himself. And in fact, when we talk about Advent and the Incarnation, this is one of the reasons that the Son of God had to become man. Because it was only by becoming man that Jesus could represent man. It was only by becoming man that Jesus could stand in our place, literally, and take the punishment that we deserved. Jesus was acting as our representative. And he was the greatest representative. When he died on the cross, he was literally standing in our place to offer a sacrifice on our behalf. So when we say Jesus is a priest, he's our representative. But secondly, when we say he's a priest, he's also our mediator. Now, a mediator, as you probably know, is someone who stands between two parties to try to reconcile a broken relationship or a conflict. And in the Old Testament, that's part of what priests did. That was part of their role. As they stood between God and man 
in order to be mediators between God and man. But these priestly mediators had a couple of problems. The first problem was that they themselves were sinners. They had sins of their own. So when the priests went in to offer a sacrifice in the temple, they didn't just have to offer sacrifices for the people. They had to offer sacrifices for themselves, which tells you something. It tells you that these men themselves were alienated from God and separated from God, which means they could never be perfect mediators. That was the first problem. The second problem was that their sacrifices never fully dealt with sin because they had to be offered over and over and over again. And year after year after year, these sacrifices would continue. And what this points to is the fact that the people needed a perfect mediator. The people needed a mediator who had no sins of his own. The people needed a mediator who could deal with sin once and for all and offer some kind of sacrifice that would deal with sin definitively so it would never have to be dealt with again. And of course, the New Testament tells us Jesus is that mediator. Hebrews 7.27 says, He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus doesn't need to offer these repeated sacrifices. His sacrifice deals with sin once for all. Or listen to what Hebrews 10 says. Hebrews 10, 11, Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, for by a single sacrifice he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You see, Jesus had no sins of his own. So he could be the only one who could truly die for the sins of others. And his sacrifice didn't need to be offered over and over again. It dealt with sin definitively once and for all. What was his sacrifice? His sacrifice was his own blood. His sacrifice was himself. Hebrews 9.12 says, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. We see this all over the place. Hebrews 9.26 says, But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus is not just as a priest, our representative, but he's also our mediator. He's the perfect mediator. And thirdly, one other thing that Jesus does and is as a priest is he is our intercessor. In the Old Testament, once again, the priests acted as intercessors. They interceded on behalf of, of the people and offered prayers to God for the people and offerings to God for the people and sacrifices for the people. They were, they were intercessors, but they weren't perfect intercessors. And one of the reasons that they weren't perfect intercessors is actually just really, really basic, and that is that they died. They couldn't be com continual intercessors for people because they get old and they die, and then there would be no more intercessors, so they have to bring in more priests to be new intercessors for the people. And then those priests would die, and they'd have to bring in more. And you see that they could never really be perfect, ongoing intercessors for the people. But Jesus, in contrast, he was a perfect intercessor. His intercession is eternal. Listen to these words from Hebrews 7. Chapter 7, verse 23. It says, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you know that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus makes intercession for you? In other words, you don't ever have to worry, uh, well, well, do I have access to God? Do I, does God accept me? You don't have to worry about that if you're a believer because the very Son of God makes intercession for you to God the Father. Is there any better intercessor than that? Is there any better access than that? No, the answer is no. We see words about this throughout the New Testament. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 33, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? 
Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Jesus intercedes for us, for those who trust in him. And it's worth noting that his intercession on our behalf doesn't just cover the past or the present, it covers the future. You know, when we read in 1 John that even in our future, as we stumble and we fall, if we sin, we can go to God and we can ask for forgiveness and we will be forgiven because we have an advocate. 1 John 2 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, or you might say an intercessor with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the ultimate intercessor. And the gift of frankincense, as I said, points us back to the priesthood, because incense is exclusively associated with the priests. And so when we say that Jesus is a priest, and that this gift symbolized the fact that he is the great high priest, We're saying that he is the one who is our representative. He is the one who is our mediator. He is the one who is our intercessor. But I think there's even more than that here. I think there's a second great truth that this gift symbolizes. And that's the presence of the living God. The presence of the living God. If you go back with me to Exodus chapter 30... And you read through that chapter... You'll notice that the placement of this altar of incense was very significant. Inside the temple, or the tabernacle, there were two major areas that it was divided into. The first major area, the largest area, was called the holy place. It was also known as just the sanctuary. This is the area where the priests would regularly go in and normally perform most of their duties. But there was a second room in the temple, a second area that was... That was closed off behind a a big curtain. And it was known as the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And it was understood that that was the place where the presence of the living God would descend and would dwell. And no one would go into that place except the high priest once a year. And if you did, you would die. Because you could not stand. A sinful person could not stand in the presence of the living God. Now here's what's interesting. If you look at Exodus 30, where the altar of incense is kept, it sat just immediately outside the entrance to the Holy of Holies. As the cloud of incense went up, it went up right in the gateway up to the very presence of God. It was as if this cloud surrounded the place where the living presence of God sat. And that's even emphasized if you read back through Exodus 30. If you look at Exodus 30, verse 6, it says, You shall put it, that's the altar of incense, in front of the veil that is above the ark of testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will meet with you. Where God himself would meet. Look at verse 34, Exodus 30, 34 says, The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stacti, anica, galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put part of it before the testimony of the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. In a sense, what do we see here? that the the cloud of incense and the altar of incense, the tabernacle, was at the very place where God would meet with his people, at the very place where the presence of the living God would dwell. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that frankincense is given to Jesus, not just because he is the great high priest, but also because he is the place and is the person where the presence of the living God could be found. When the wise men brought gifts to Jesus, they were entering into the presence of the living God himself, just like the high priests who entered that area of the temple. So in this way, frankincense points us not just to that priesthood of Jesus, but to the deity of Jesus. As the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2.9, 
For in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. You know, there are a lot of people today in the world today who want to have an encounter with God. They want to know God. They want to know if they have access to God. And what we learn here and what we see here is that you can know God. You can have a relationship with God. You can have access to God. There's only one path, though, and that's through Jesus. Because Jesus is the one in whom the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Jesus is the one who is the only mediator who can grant us access to God. He is the only way to God. He's the only path to God. And therefore, if you want to know God, you can know God. But you can only know God through Jesus. So we come to Jesus because he is the one who has granted us access. He is the priest who has atoned for our sins. He is the one where we meet the presence of the living God. He is not only a king, but he is our great high priest. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we cannot thank you adequately for your grace in sending your son to be our great high priest. We thank you, O Lord, that we have access to you through the death of your Son. And Lord, we pray that this reality would give us confidence to boldly approach your throne each and every day, to seek your face each and every day, and to know that is through Christ and Christ alone, that we can have relationship with you. Lord, may we know this today. And may we proclaim this every day. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.